Outstanding. Next up is my good friend, Dr. Richard Shapiro, who is, if George is my go-to pathologist, Rich is my go-to surgeon. Uh, he and I have a very good relationship, and he's a professor of surgery at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And like I said, he is, uh, he's my guy. So Rich, uh, he's going to talk about whether we can truly cure melanoma. And frankly, let's face it, most of the cures of melanoma occur when the surgeons use cold steel. Rich, can you share your screen? Let me share my screen. Hopefully I don't mess this up. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you everyone for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to review kind of what's going on in surgery in terms of uh, how we treat melanoma in 2021. It may not be as sexy as uh, some of the things that Dr. Jor and Dr. Weber and Menor and others are going to talk about, but here we go. Uh, so when we think about uh, melanomas and people say they have skin cancer, you have to understand that melanoma is a lot more aggressive than the more, much more common basal and squamous cell carcinomas. And melanoma, and we're seeing more and more another tumor called Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, tend to be much more aggressive and we treat them quite differently. And one of the interesting things about melanoma is it has a propensity to, per, to create what we call satellite metastases. And these are just some pictures. I hope they're not disturbing to anyone. Uh, but the reason why melanoma in the past has been treated so aggressively surgically is because melanoma does this and other cancers such as basal cell cancers and squamous cell cancers don't. And so that is really why uh, radical surgery, especially in the past, was required to take care of this tumor. So I'd like to just go over the historical perspective and rationale for how wide we go around melanomas. In 1907, a surgeon named Hadley recommended five centimeter or two and a half inch margins around melanoma because they believed that melanoma spread along the lymphatic system. In the 1960s, even wider 15 centimeter margins, which is really the size of a coffee can, uh, were recommended because again, they assumed melanoma spread along lymphatics and veins around the tumor. But in 1977, Breslow, a medical student, challenged the concept of wide local excision because he published a paper saying that when melanomas were thin and he defined thin as less than 0.76 millimeters, they never really recurred irrespective of how wide the margins were. And there were several very good studies uh, performed, uh, one by Veronese in 1980, where they randomized people to narrow one centimeter margin and wide three centimeter margins and whether your melanoma was less than a millimeter or one to two millimeters thick, the survival rates were the same. There were more local failures with narrower margins, but the patients did the same long-term. And again, a much larger study was done later, a New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, where they looked at melanomas that were two millimeters thick or greater, and again, and ascend half the patients had one centimeter margins, the other half had three centimeter margins, and again, while there were some relapses in patients with narrower margins, the survival was the same. And so it became very clear uh, through good studies and through about 100 years of surgery that narrower margins can e lead to an increased local recurrence rate, but there's no impact on survival. And so our guidelines that we practice now are the following. For in situ or non-invasive melanomas, we recommend five millimeter margins. I know that some dermatologists are practicing Mohs surgery, and I have a lot to say about that. I can speak about that later. Some, pay, some people are doing slightly wider margins, but five millimeters is the accepted margin for an in situ melanoma. For melanomas that are invasive one millimeter or less, it's pretty standard to do a one centimeter margin. For so-called intermediate thickness melanomas, one to four millimeters, the standard of care would be a two centimeter margin, although there are some papers now that show a slightly narrower margin, especially on the face uh, for cosmetic uh, issues may be safe. And for deeper melanomas that are four millimeters or greater, we tend to do three centimeter margins, although two centimeters would be the standard. So let's just talk about regional lymph nodes and lymph node dissections, which is a very well discussed and well studied topic. We remove lymph nodes in patients for cancer with cancer for the following reasons. We can stage them or to see how far the disease has gone. It could be with the intent to cure people. It could be with the intent to remove or debulk as much of the tumor as we possibly can, or it can be in sometimes to alleviate patients that have some bleeding or some pain in the area called palliation. 
And when you talk about the extent of lymph node dissections, and if you get into the literature and start reading, there are a lot of terms that get thrown around. For example, therapeutic dissections in the bottom of the table really means that the lymph nodes are enlarged and we're removing them with the intent of treating the patient. We now perform what we call selective lymph node dissections through sentinel lymph node biopsy in the top of the table. And that's for patients that have clinically negative nodes, but we don't know what's going on microscopically. And the rationale for sentinel lymph node biopsy, which has really changed the entire field of surgical oncology, uh, was created and first proposed by Donald Morton at the John Wayne Cancer Center in 1992. And they developed a technique whereby you could map the patient's lymphatic drainage pathways with blue dye and radioactive dye and identify the first lymph node in the chain of lymph nodes closest to the melanoma that we call the sentinel node. And the idea is, is that melanoma will spread in a very orderly, predictable way, first to the sentinel node. And it seems to spread the way Christmas tree lights are arranged. So if you can remove the first lymph node in the chain or the first bulb in that chain and prove it's clean, we have a pretty good idea that nothing has gone past that node and that makes further surgery unnecessary. And so when we started doing this, we applied sentinel lymph node biopsy and offered it to patients that had one millimeter thick melanomas or greater that had no evidence of spread to the lymph nodes. We're careful about this in patients that have had extensive surgeries in the area, such as widening deep excisions with flap closures, multiple surgeries in the area, or difficult or complicated lymphocentigraphy scans. And I'll show you this in a minute because we're really not sure whether it's gonna be accurate. And the last thing we wanna do is subject the patient to surgery and give you information that's not accurate. We certainly wouldn't do sentinel lymph node biopsy in patients with very thin melanomas because they rarely spread. People that have recurrent melanoma, we know already need treatment. And so we're not going to do sentinel lymph node biopsies in those patients or patients that present with lymph nodes that are already swollen and involved because we know that they're involved already. So there were two very large, very well-performed studies done in the last 20 years uh, internationally. One, the multi-center selective lymphadenectomy trial number one, through which NYU played a big part where we work, and the MSLT2 trial. And essentially, just to review and summarize, uh, they showed in the first trial that sentinel lymph node biopsy is uh, a viable and valid correct technique to predict whose melanomas have spread. And then the MSLT2 trial showed that there was really no benefit in removing more lymph nodes in patients that only had spread to the sentinel lymph node. And this was a big deal because removing all the lymph nodes, especially in the groin or under your arm in the axilla can lead to lymphedema in a significant number of patients. And that's very troubling. So what about patients that have thin melanomas that I'm going to define as less than one millimeter? Should those people undergo sentinel lymph node biopsy? And you, you can see from this table that when you look at melanomas that are under 0.75 millimeters in thickness, the sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity rate is extremely low and it happens very rarely, 2%, 4%. But when you look at melanomas that are slightly thicker in the 0.75 to one millimeter range, you can see that the rate of sentinel lymph nodes being positive can be as high as 10%. And so it, it, we started to look at this in our own series and in approximately a thousand cases uh, that we've operated on at NYU of patients that presented with melanomas under one millimeter that underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy, we saw that only 5% of them actually had positive sentinel nodes. That was 11 out of 240 patients. And when you look at these patients, you can see on the left that it's really those patients in the 0.75 to one millimeter range that were most effective. And so we decided, uh, as did other groups, that we were going to offer this procedure to patients with melanomas that went down to 0.75 millimeters, especially if they were associated with something called ulceration, which is a change we see in melanomas under the microscope that portends a more aggressive behavior, or patients that have something called lymphovascular invasion, where we can actually see cells in the lymphatic system moving towards the lymph nodes. And so really, as in all things in medicine, it's risk versus benefit. So it's really looking at a rule of 5%. So the chance of having a positive lymph node has to be greater than the chance that we have complications such as lymphedema. 
And so the sent lymph node biopsy recommendations at NYU and for most other places are the following. For less than 0.8 millimeters, we do not offer it. For melanomas over one millimeter, we do offer it. And when we're 0.8 to one millimeter, we look at such things as ulceration and mitotic rate and try to pick out the patients that are more apt to have a thicker melanoma that will spread to the lymph nodes. But all of this is determined in the bottom of this slide by the complete thickness of the melanoma. Because remember, if a melanoma is bi uh, biopsied by shave biopsy, it may be actually deeper than the biopsy suggests. So all of this goes into the mix. And it's another reason why we're very um, interested in having our pathologists, such as George Dorr, look at these slides that can give us a better idea of how thick the melanoma actually is. So just to summarize, for stage zero or in site two melanomas, we offer a five millimeter margin. For melanomas that are stage one, those are thinly invasive, we will do a one centimeter margin and we'll consider sent lymph node biopsy for those melanomas that are greater than 0.8 or those melanomas that are ulcerated. For thicker invasive melanomas, we do offer sent lymph node biopsy with wider margin. For stage three patients, Patients that present with lymph nodes that are already involved in swollen, we do complete dissections. And for those that have thicker melanomas and no evidence of lymph node disease, we do sent lymph node biopsies. And for stage four patients, those patients that have disease outside the lymph nodes, we will offer them surgery in selected cases. And so even though, as I said, and when Dr. Weber and Dr. Menet start to speak, you'll see that it's very complicated and what they're doing is pretty amazing and very uh, sophisticated, that surgery really accurately diagnoses and treats over 95% of patients. And so we you know, can't forget that, that the majority of patients with melanoma are actually treated by their dermatologist, their surgeon, the primary care physician, and about 5% of patients need and can take advantage of all these incredible advances. So remember that the best way to treat a cancer is to prevent it and to diagnose it early. The ABCDE rule, which was uh, uh, put forth by the group at NYU and refined by the group at NYU, uh, you, know, low, you know, internationally really to help uh, people diagnose melanomas or moles that are apt to be melanomas that are asymmetrical, B, the borders are regular, C, the color varies, D, the diameter is greater, than six millimeters and E or evolving moles that evolve. So NYU has played a big role in early detection of melanoma. And practically just something also to remember, and I referred to it a few minutes ago, there's a big difference between a melanoma that's been completely excised because we know exactly how deep it is because the depth of the melanoma predicts the bi potential biological aggressiveness, which will lead us to our treatment recommendations versus a melanoma that's incompletely excised. And so that's why it's very important for me as a surgeon to talk to the dermatologist and to look at the slides I have them looked at by our dermatopathologist to give me a better idea of how deep this melanoma is apt to be. So I just wanna spend one minute on neoadjuvant therapy for locally immense melanoma. Melanomas can you know, be quite extensive if they're not treated. Unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of this in the COVID era where patients were not able to come in for treatment for one or two years. And so melanomas such as this in the groin, which is quite extensive, were a big problem in the past. And we're looking at things such as Aldara cream. It's a local immunotherapy cream that could sometimes shrink these lesions, making them more amenable to surgical treatment. Also patients that present with locally aggressive disease, many satellites, we can do targeted or immunotherapy neoadjuvantly or before we consider surgery. And this is a new thing for melanoma. It was first really proposed for the management of locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, and now we're looking at it uh, as we have more and more tools to treat melanoma. And when we're offering treatment before surgery, and again, it's, it's one reason why patients that have these aggressive or extensive melanomas really benefit by going to a medical center that has what we call full thickness uh, multidisciplinary group because we can all see the patient and throw our two cents in uh, before we offer a treatment plan. Are we trying to enhance its resectability to decrease its local recurrence or actually hopefully increase survival? So this is just a, uh, an illustration of this. This is um, a patient of mine, a 49 year old man who presented with extensive, this is a PET scan, extensive lymph node metastases 
from a very thin melanoma. And this is not surgically curable. However, after getting four cycles of Ipinevo uh, by Dr. Weber, virtually all his disease went away. And that was really incredible. So you turned an inoperable situation now to an operable one. So this clearly enhanced this patient's resectability. So it's very clear that surgery can prevent melanoma from spreading in over 95% of patients. But then when it really gets out of hand and, and is locally and regionally aggressive, we now have immunotherapy or targeted therapy that can enable us to offer surgical treatment, which is a huge advance. There are a lot of clinical trials going on to study this, and it's becoming more and more in the mainstream, especially at big centers, where you can take advantage of being seen by a dermatologist, a surgeon, and a medical oncologist. So that, in a nutshell, is really what's going on in surgically for melanoma. I thank everyone for getting up early, especially those of you on the left part of the country, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.